Need your daily fix on mixed martial arts? We're going to kind of recap Bellator 155. From UFC 198. Who's who. Kind of a controversial decision. And who's not. I couldn't figure out why, and then it hit me. Well, don't you fret, because Golden State Media Concepts got, got you, you covered. covered. Get your daily dose of MMA podcasts. Everything from the UFC, Bellator Fighting Championships, Extreme Cage Fighting, and Victor Fighting Championships, and, and, and so, so much, much more. more. Join us as we talk about some of the big Biggest names in mixed martial arts. We've got you covered here on Golden State Media Concepts MMA Podcast. Thank you for tuning into the GSMC MMA Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Arnold Zolion, and hopefully you are doing well for yourself. You, your friends, your family, whether you live in the States or international, I hope you're doing fine for yourself during a time of major, major uncertainty. And so I gotta point this out right now. Yes, as I am currently speaking, the elections are technically, technically, not technically, officially, officially over. Uh, the past week has been super complicated. Very stressful. Actually, as I am walking down my neighborhood, I have been bugged three times in the past five days of someone saying, Hey, who did you vote for? Who are you supporting? And I'm like, well, I can't give you a response because whoever I say, you're going to give me the bad luck. All right, then. And it's happened. Like, have you been on social media? Anybody here listening to this right now, if you've been on social media, get away from it, okay? It is a whole lot of toxicity there. It's not a pleasant place to be. But, although the role of social media is very toxic and can be very negative, I will say this, though, that, oh my goodness, MMA has been totally awesome. I have been actually overloaded Watching a whole lot of mixed martial arts stuff, especially ba- also like basketball stuff. Um, watching like the finals and going to the bubble and like going through all the news of what's going on right now with the NBA restarting, football season. It's just uh, a lot of things keeping me up at night. We have one championship, Bellator, UFC, pretty much all, all the major mixed martial arts organizations from UFC, Bellator, Invicta, and one championship pretty much going very silky smooth and... They're keeping at it. Their businesses are going afloat right now. Uh, for those of you who are unaware, in the recent one championship event, I think it was like one championship inside the Matrix. Like that was the name of their show. And in that show, it was taking place in Singapore. That's this indoor arena in Singapore. And inside that arena, there was some people there. There were actual audience members, not just the not not just corner men, not just camera crew members, not just people who are working the TV stations. Like no, actual audience members were there. The fight was between uh, Tiffany Teo against Zhang Jian, and in that fight, it was so bizarre that Tiffany Teo was the babyface good guy there because Tiffany she goes into the she goes in the cage. The announcer is like. Coming in here, Tiffany Teo, and you hear the audience being like, "Woo, yeah!" Then, but then when the announcer was announcing Jean, the crowd started booing, and I'm just like, "It's complete night and day." Like, I miss this. I really do miss the crowd being there because I watched uh, one championship, and then I immediately then watched Bellator and UFC, and like the entire atmosphere was complete night and day, knowing that there's an audience there. For one show and in another uh, group, other shows, there are no audiences. It's, eh. And it's especially awkward for the Dana Contender Series, which I try to watch, but like the atmosphere is very awkward and stuff. And there's a whole lot of pressure to it also. So uh, it does get kind of upsetting um, watching those watching those shows because I miss the crowd. I really do. And I believe here that if there was a crowd for this event, oh my goodness, it'd be great. It'd be awesome, with the exception of one, one meh fight, the crowd would be, that would, would get their money, like, their money would be paid due, man. They would love this show here. So, I'll be talking about UFC Fight Night, which was uh, Santos versus Teixeira. Diego Santos versus Glover Teixeira, winner of this fight, will be the number contender for uh, John Blackowitz. I can't say his name correctly. I think I heard uh, John Anik say, Jan Blanachowicz. 
and then like I hear Dominic Cruz say like his name differently, but I'm used to calling him John Blackwoods because like that's how I read out his last name. But uh, I'll be talking about UFC Finite here. Let's talk about the main event: Diago Santos versus Glover Teixeira. Back and forth action. This, without a doubt, was the most even keeled fight of the entire night. High is how I viewed it, though. There were some other fights here that were very evenly matched, but the Santos versus the Sheriff fights, oh my goodness. There were moments where I was like, oh, dude, Santos is winning this. And there were moments where I'm like, oh, man, dude, Tichero is definitely winning this fight. But no, it didn't went off like that. So I'll go off in a per round basis and give the results here. So winner of this fight becomes the more contender for the light heavy title. Teixeira gets rocked immediately and then shoots in for a takedown. And you know Teixeira is rocked because as he is going in for the takedown, his legs are all wobbly. There was an instance where as he was attempting a double leg onto Santos, Teixeira just rolled onto his back and he just pulled Santos in onto mount position on himself. It was weird. It was definitely a very strange sight seeing Glover Teixeira pull Santos in into help. He's just like helping him out get to mount. But since Santos' grappling ability isn't all that up to par, uh, Santos really uh, didn't take it all that well. And then Teixeira was able to pull him down. And then, here's just murder. Glover Teixeira gets a waist lock and slams him onto the ground. Right to mount position. Glover Teixeira, 43 years old, man. This dude is a proper stud. Slamming this big guy to the ground here, getting on mount. Then from here, uh, Santos does a good job defending himself in the sense that he really wasn't overwhelmed from the ground pounds. But more so, Glover Sheriff was constantly switching positions. He would always go between half guard, side position, and mount position. And he would go there and he'd just put all his body weight in there and make it as uncomfortable as possible for Ortega Santos. So although Glover Sheriff isn't running down like gigantic elbows or huge hammer fists, he was making Santos work. So Teixeira was able to get in some ground and pound pressure. And I put down here, by the end of it, first round, Glover Teixeira wins. Glover Teixeira won the first round because although Teixeira Santos, he rocked Teixeira hard. The fact that Teixeira controlled Teixeira Santos in four out of the five minutes of the fights, I got to give it to Teixeira for his total ground control. And then we get to the second round here. Uh, Teixeira immediately gets a takedown in 25 seconds in and works his way up to mount. And it's really cool here because Glover Teixeira... Hits a proper spine buster in MMA. For those of you who don't know what a spine buster is, look up Glover Share right now or look up Dave Batista when he does a spine buster. Just type in spine buster on YouTube and you're going to see it. Glover Share hits a huge spine buster on Diego Santos. And if Diego Santos had more BGJ training to him, he could have done something here, but he really couldn't. Diego Santos was pretty much like a fish out of water when he was on the ground here, and Glover Share just had took full advantage of him. Uh, Teco Santos is saved by the bell as Glover Teixeira gets a rear naked choke. It was like in the final four seconds. Glover Teixeira, he rakes in the rear naked choke. Diego Santos, both of his arms are out there. All he has to do is take it all in. He ain't tapping out. He is taking this rear naked choke. But, bell saves him. And this which leads to Dominic Cruz saying, Ah, oh, look at Diego Santos. Saved by the bell there. Yep. Saved by the bell. Ha ha ha. Yep, saved by the bell. Saved by the bell, like the TV show. And was like, ugh. Dominic Cruz was kind of tough to listen to in the show. And um, I might as well bring this up, actually. But, oh, my gosh. Like, the presentation here was kind of off. It really was. Dominic Cruz, this entire show, was really off. It was strange. Uh, Teixeira tries to go for a double leg immediately. He tries to replicate what he did in the second round and the third round here. But... Diego Santos lands a left hand and knocks down Glover Teixeira. Santos, with no fear, gets on half guard and starts running some ground and pound action. And I genuinely thought that this is the moment Diego Santos would win the fight here. He was raining in some hammer fists, raining in some forearms. Glover Teixeira looks dazed and confused. I thought Teixeira would win this. I mean, I thought uh, Santos would win this. But then, Teixeira reverses. He starts clinching with Santos, pushes up to the cage, and then immediately goes on half guard. He goes on half guard, flips him over, gets on back mount, gets a rear naked choke. Glover Teixeira wins the fight in the third round via submission, rear naked choke. Awesome showing there. An absolute awesome showing there by Glover Teixeira. Uh, Teco Santos, he did the best he could. He really did. There were moments in this fight where it looked like, oh man, 
Santos is going to win this fight. And you know what? Obviously, out of the two people here, Santos was obviously winning in the striking exchanges. And when I'm thinking about Glover Teixeira versus John Black, which was the next fight that's going to be coming up in the light heavyweight division, I'm thinking here, for as good as a grappler Glover Teixeira is, he got rocked way too often. He got caught way too much in this fight against Santos. And John Ennick said it best in the sense that if Glover Teixeira is going to be fighting against John, Thiago Santos was the perfect was a perfect opponent to prep up Glover Teixeira here. Because I'm telling you right now here, if John Blackowitz was able to land any of those counter-strikes that Diego Santos was able to land, oh my goodness, lights out. I say John Blackowitz hits harder and is a better striker than Diego Santos. Knowing that, knowing that Glover Teixeira has a tendency early in the rounds of getting rocked, and it was shown here, first round got knocked, uh, got, got, got knocked down in about 40 seconds. And then in the third round here, he got he got knocked down in in just 25 seconds. So pretty much here, the opening to defeat Glover Teixeira is within the first minute of the fight here. Also in the second round, Glover Teixeira, he went for a risk going for that spine buster. And you know, it, pan, it worked out well for him. But I don't think he will be able to do that against somebody like Jan Blackwoods here. Especially if, you know, Jan Blackwoods, I'm pretty sure he'll be prepping up and he'll be setting up his BGJ game. Now, Jan Blackwood's BGJ game ain't all that advanced. But I think knowing how knowing how Teixeira handles this fight against Santos, I'm pretty sure Blackwood's during training camp is going to make the extra effort into making sure that he'll be in a position where he can go and defeat Aguilar Teixeira even though he's on the ground. That's that. That's really it. Also, here's nothing. Something to note here. Glover Shera, he doesn't go for any ground and pound. He really doesn't. He does some ground and pound, but for the most part here, all he's doing is that he's applying a lot of pressure on you. He's trying to tire out, tire you out, and he's trying to make it as uncomfortable as possible for you, so you can go and squirm around, so you can go find a proper opening for himself to go for a kimura lock or to go for a guillotine choke or a rear naked choke. But if it takes time for Glover Teixeira to prep himself up into trying to get a submission victory and he pretty much has a bad first minute in every round or he has to go do something risky in the first minute of every round, then wow, I'm not really that much of a believer that Glover Teixeira can defeat on Blackwoods. Now, for all I know, I can be completely wrong here. I really can for all I know, John Blackwood, he's going to go for right overhand. Glover Sherrill, he ducks under, gets a double leg takedown, and sinks in a choke. It can definitely happen. It can definitely happen. But from right now, from this performance here, you know what? Glover Sherrill, proper warrior, took heavy shots, got rocked multiple times by Santos here. Glover Sherrill was able to recover and pull out the submission victory. Good on you for Glover Sherrill. Deca Santos, what is next for you? What is next for Diego Santos? What I, if I was the match booker here, I would say Dominic Reyes versus Santos. It makes the most sense. We got two fighters here. They're ranked number three and ranked number four. Two primarily good strikers here. And also, I think it would be good for both fighters here. I think, I think style-wise, it is perfect for both fighters. In a sense that we got two dudes who are not known for grappling, not known for BGJ. Two fighters who really like fighting each other in the middle of each other's pockets here. I can see Dominic Reyes against Diego Santos being an exciting fight, an exciting back-and-forth action fight, where we're going to see two dudes scrapping it out. We would also It would also be a really good learning opportunity for both fighters here, in that Dominic Reyes can go and try to learn how to fight someone similar to John Blackwoods. So if they were to fight again in a rematch, then Dominic Reyes would be way more prepped up. And then for Otego Santos here, it's going to work on his um, on his like counter on his counter punching and ability to recognize you know good openings because if if you can defeat Dominic Reyes, uh, if you can handle the boxing of Dominic Reyes and you can handle the power of you can handle the power of Diego Santos, then I think that should prep you up against somebody like Teixeira and John Blackwoods. So I say Dominic Reyes versus Diego Santos. That's an incredibly fun matchup. 
if only, if only there is a crowd being there. Uh, currently, I know right now the NBA, they are not going to do a bubble. So when they did the playoffs and then when they came back to the NBA season, they did this bubble thing where they kept everything in one like isolated area. The NFL ain't doing that. They ain't doing that. Uh, one championship, they're getting a crowd in. And I can ex- and here's the thing. I know there's gonna be another country reclosing right now. I know Cal- me here, me living here in California, they are still pushy and very like California is weird. Like some businesses are open, some businesses are closed. In some parts of California, things look back to normal. In some other parts of California, it's still in heavy lockdown. It's strange. But hopefully we can get crowds back in because I would like to see Dominic Reyes versus Diego Santos fighting each other in front of a large crowd. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. And we are back. Once again, you are listening to the GSMC MMA Podcast. And I was just talking about Glover Deschera versus Diego Santos being the main event for UFC Fight Night, Santos versus Deschera. To which Glover Deschera was able to pull away with the comeback victory. Rear naked choke submission victory in the third round for Glover Deschera. It'll be Glover Deschera versus John Blackwitz. That is expected to be the next major title fight happening in the light heavyweight scene there. I say John Blackwitz will be the favorite going into that fight against Glover Deschera. Glover Deschera got rocked too many times, and I do believe that if John Blackwitz was the fight was a fighter here across the octagon fighting against Glover Deschera, it would be a very different result here. Uh, Glover Deschera takes way too many risks in the first minute, and he gets caught off guard way too much early on. That if John Blackwitz, he only needs one punch, man. Blackwitz just needs one more punch, and I'm not saying Diego Santos doesn't hit hard. It is Santos. He's the current. I mean, um, John Blackwoods. I think he just hits a wee bit harder than Santos, and his boxing is a wee bit better. So Glover Shera was able to get away doing things to Santos that I don't think he'll be able to get away, get away with if you're to fight against the lightweight champion. And so the narrative for Santos and Glover Shera was: Does Glover Shera does he still have it despite his age of 43? And well. Co-main event was Andre Arlovsky versus Tanner Bozer. Does Andre Arlovsky still have it? All right, then. Let me talk about the presentation of the show before I talk about this specific fight here. Because this fight... Oh, man. If this fight was in front of a crowd, every fight here in this night was great. Fun. If this is in front of a crowd, I can guarantee there'll be a lot of people like standing up and clapping because there are a lot of strong performances here. But Arlovsky versus Tanner Bozer, if this was in front of a crowd, the crowd would start booing. They would start booing. They would start saying this is boring. The commentary team would actually try harder, trying to hide the boos and trying to make the fight sound more interesting than it actually is. But the presentation of the show was off immediately the second this show started. I have never watched a UFC Fight Night show that has gone through so many weird technical errors and like commentary issues than this one show here. Because when UFC Fight Night, because I watch this uh, via ESPN Plus for my PS4. So I open up PS4, go to ESPN Plus. So we're transitioning from the prelims to the main card. All right then. UFC Fight Night officially starts 7 p.m. 
We have an overhead shot of the UFC Apex facility building in Vegas. And then you can hear John Anik being like, Welcome to the... Las Vegas... Las Vegas is a... And the... It was weird. Because he was talking and his audio was being picked up to the actual stadium arena. So you're hearing John Anik speak. Being like, welcome to the... And, and then you can hear an echo. And then you can hear like an overlaying voice over John Anik. And then John Anik, he's filling around with his microphone and his headset. Then we get a two-way split screen with him and Dominic Cruz. Dominic Cruz just like, you know, like twirling his thumb here. Not really sure what's happening. And then he has to go try to listen to John Anik as there are audio issues for Anik. And Dominic Cruz is like, hey, man. Oh, it's so good to be here, man. I've been training really hard for my comeback, for my second, third comeback. And I'm ready to go get the show going. I'm excited for the show. And let me go to Andre Olofsky versus Tanner Bozer. First thing I put down my notes here. Commentary team are bored. It took two and a half. This is according to John Ack. It took two and a half minutes until Andre Olofsky landed his first strike. Two and a half minutes. Because every single fight, every single fight, it's always like, all right then, Santos, Teixeira, or, uh, it'd be Santos, Teixeira, or Shaunan, or Nkadilla. Here we go, all right then, this fight is brought to you by blah, blah, blah. I'm excited for this matchup over here. Like, Cruz and Anik always try to sound, uh, try to sound that uh, they are excited for this fight, and you better be hyped up for this. But nope, not for a loss, give his buzzer. The second the bell rang, referee says, Let's get the fight going on. Yeah, let's do it. And then both fighters meet in the center of the cage. Commentary team have nothing to say. They have nothing. These two big heavyweights are just poking each other. And the commentary team, you can hear them like cuffing. You can hear their breath. You can actually, you can hear that they are trying to think of what to say next. Because they got nothing to say about this fight. And then I want to point out, Dominic Cruz and John Anik are being very passive-aggressive. One of them goes on to say, the, oh no, I think it was Dominic Cruz. He said, he goes on to say, these two are counter-strikers. And because they're both counter-strikers, nothing is happening. Yep. The John Anik is, yep, um, nothing's happening. And uh, Andre Olofsky, ain't he great? It's just, like, oh my gosh. Like, the majority of the lines that John Anik said in this fight was on okay, it reminded you know it, it reminded of me when I did baseball commentary and I understand the basic fundamentals of baseball but I just can't do commentary. I can do commentary for basketball. Like I love basketball. I can do commentary for hours about basketball. I can talk about the game there. But for baseball though, since I'm not that big of a fan in baseball, now I've been to baseball games and they are really fun. I recommend everybody, anybody to go to baseball games once this whole COVID thing is, you know, put to the side here. But John Anik sounds like me when I'm calling a baseball game. Because when I was calling a baseball game uh, for uni, I was like, yep, look at that person there. He's got the ball. Winding up the pitch. And was that a was that a ball? Oh, that was not a ball. Okay, okay then. Yeah, it's like there are uh, thirteen players in the dugout. It's uh, seventy degrees outside. It's just like like I'm just saying whatever I can because I don't want to talk about the actual baseball game. I really don't. And then so Dominic Cruz is like talking about this fight in the most passive aggressive way, being like. These two fighters, they ain't doing anything. They hear John Anik being like, By the way, don't forget to watch the Dana White Contender Series. And then you hear the music for the Dana White Contender Series. Like, it's all epic and stuff. <laughs> and it's overshadowing this really boring fight. And then Anik and Dominic Cruz, they start giggling. They start giggling because... <laughs> I don't know, I think it's, it's one of them. They look over to the side, and one of them was saying, You know, Mike Brown over there, the coach for Olofsky, he looks happy, you know, for some reason, you know, because Arlovski is showing vision. <laughs> He's showing striking accuracy. <laughs> it is, oh my gosh, the unprofessionalism for Anik and Cruz here 
is just like at 11 here. They are making fun of Arlovsky's cornermen. They are making fun of Boza's cornermen. They are making fun of the fact that these two big behemoths in Arlovsky and Bozer are just not trying putting effort. And then, and then, they pulled over because Anik and Cruz, because of the fact they have nothing to say about this fight, they pulled over like their third man in the computer team who is an actual like fight coach and he just starts complaining. Like, John Anik and Dominic Cruz are like, hey, tell me, what is your opinion on this fight? And the third commentary guy comes in. He's like, yeah, um, to be perfectly honest with you, I'm really disappointed in this fight. Uh, nothing's really happening. <laughs> Just, uh, Yeah, no one is happy to watch this fight. No one is. I put it on here. First round is over. I don't know who won. And then, and then as I am thinking, as I am typing it down, first round is over. I don't know who won. You hear Cruz being like, Yep, I have no clue when that fights. And you can hear John Anik going to say, Good thing we're calm to our team because I wouldn't want to be a judge. <laughs> oh man, these two guys are proper surly. So second round starts. Crew starts saying, Hey, why are the coaches happy? They didn't do anything. <laughs> because the calm to team, they can hear everything that's going on. They can hear the coaches. And then Anik and Crew start complaining. They're like, I don't get why these coaches would give pep talk to their fighters when they're not doing anything. So Anik starts, since Anik has nothing to say about the fight here, because he's the play-by-play guy. Yeah, he's the play-by-play guy while Cruz is a color commentator. You can't really do the play-by-play if both Boser and Arlovsky are throwing in these like leg kicks that are obviously not really doing any substantial damage and are both hitting the air for the most part. And it starts going to be like, Andre Arlovsky, you know, former UFC heavyweight champion. You know, uh, he wasn't around during 2008, 2011. But he stuck to it. Arlovsky, a legend in the sports. Tanner Bozer, trying to make a name of himself, trying to fight a guy who was a legend in Andre Arlovsky. Yeah. I put down here, commentary team are as quiet as ever. And then after like two minutes of the commentary team, you forgetting that they even exist. Dominic Cruz chimes in saying, Nothing much to say here. I'd like to see a lot more body shots. Then Anik is like, Yups. If they did they should do more body shots. Then the third round commentary team was like, I agree with you, Dominic Cruz. They should do something. <laughs> uh, second round. Winner of that round. I don't know. Again, I just it's I, I I'm I'm guessing Olavsky's winning. I don't know. I don't know. Is Olavsky winning? I can't tell. I just really can't. And like it was hard for me to tell. And I'm paying attention to this fight. Like I'm actually focusing here and be like, who is winning? Because both of these guys are like throwing out shots that don't mean anything. You know. You know. I'm looking this up right now. Actually, what are the significant strikes here? I want to know this. All right. Did they both attempt it? Okay, oh my goodness. So, Arlovsky landed 34 of 82. Total and significant strikes. Tanner Boser landed total and significant strikes, both 68. So, Arlovsky landed 34. Boser landed 68. This is like the polar opposites of like Ben Rothwell whenever he fights. Because the thing with Ben Rothwell, he fights kind of weird. But at least the guy's throwing a high volume of shots. These two guys, oh my goodness. So, Bozer... Uh, how do, so, spoiler here. Andre Arlovsky wins the fight via unanimous decision. I don't know how he won by unanimous decision. I don't get it. But Cruz said it best when he said, They landed 33 strikes in 15 minutes? Oh my. And you see the fight stats. And you can hear the grumbling in Dominic Cruz. Do, uh, commentary team are being angsty... The third man in commentary, he sounds upset to be there. John Anik wants his fight to end soon. Dominic Cruz is just annoyed because he knows he can fight better than these two fighters. Third round ends. And as the third round ends, you hear John Anik say, Thank goodness. Andre Arlovsky, he wins. Arlovsky wins. By unanimous decision. The fight stats don't support him. The eye tests 
doesn't support Olofsky winning. If this I went to draw, man, I'd be like, okay, totally drop. Yeah, sure, why not? Let's pack the bags here, man. But oh my goodness, this was without a doubt the worst fight of the entire night. It was. We had these two heavyweights. You know, you know what? You know what it was. Your Romero and Isio Desanya. Yeah, nothing really happened in that fight also. But at least there's like some narratives going on there in that fight. In the sense that you know if your Romero, if you were to like unleash everything, he could do something. You know Isio Desanya has knockout capabilities here. You know something can potentially happen in your Romero versus Isio Desanya. Our loss giver is Tanner Bozer here. The expectation of this fight was nothing really was going to happen. And then the actual fight happened. And it came, and it, and it turns out nothing really happened. It's nothing here. Like, oh my gosh! Like it's Andre Olovsky. There was a recent interview that popped out. I, I I don't know where I read this, but like I saw it somewhere with the headline being Andre Olovsky believes he has a chance to go get another title run at heavyweight. No, no, you don't. You don't have another title fight going on. I will give a ten. For Dan, for Tanner Bozer's mullets, I give him a ten for that. Um, yeah, nothing much to say here. I'm like Dominic Cruz and John Anik now. We're like, yep, nothing really much to say here. The fight could have been better, but it wasn't. Uh, the fight was what it was. All right then, sure. On to the next fight then. Yay. <laughs> So, you're listening to the GSMC MMA Podcast. Come back right after a short break here as I talk about the rest of the card here for UFC Fight Night. See you soon. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. And we are back. I am discussing UFC Fight Night, Santos versus the Shera. So Glover Shera, he was able to fight against Father Time here, pulling up the comeback victory, a rear naked choke out of nowhere on Diego Santos. So while Glover Shera, he at 48, is looking for a title run, Andre Lofsky himself, despite his age, he wants to go get another title run. But his fight against Tanner Bozer was definitely a fight that I don't recommend people to go watch. It was very boring. Um, commentary team, they were surly the entire fight. Uh, the fight in itself wasn't all that exciting. Yikes. But I go from talking about Arlovsky and Bozer, a very boring fight, to three very, very fun fights here. Uh, Claudia Cadella versus Jan Shunan, uh, Giga Chikazi versus Jimmy Simmons, and Ronnie Barcelos against Khalid Taha. So I'll be talking about first about the uh, two male fight, the two men's fights here because these two fights were very similar in the sense that they were both high octane action. Uh, Giga Chikazi versus Jamie Simmons. So Chikazi, a lot of stock is being thrown into this kid over here. Um, Chikazi here, he was very passive for about you know two minutes into this fight, to which. Uh, Chikaze, he just poking Jamie Simmons with uh, leg kicks, body kicks, and like these like long jabs. 
Chikazi really ain't doing that much. He's not overcoming anything. He's just go trying to find the right spots for him to go and pull out a, you know, out of nowhere knockout punch or a knockout hit onto Jamie Simmons. He's slowly, it's a very slow calculating fight style Chikazi's doing. Jamie Simmons, though, this guy, oh my goodness. Like, A, his footwork didn't look all that good. B, his boxing looked really awful. And then C, Simmons, he tried to wrestle with Chikazi. While Chikazi is trying to pick, is trying to pick, uh, pick and choose his shots, uh, Chikazi gets in a vicious body kick. He gets a body kick, hurts Simmons. Simmons drops his hands onto his tummy because his tummy hurts, and then Chikazi gets in for a knockout head kick. Chikazi gets a knockout head kick in into the first round. Good job for Giga Chikazi here. Uh, strong performance there, Jamie Simmons. Eh. That was uh, Simmons' UFC, de- UFC debut. Hopefully, he got paid really well, dude. Hopefully. I wouldn't even say Simmons was even wrestling with Chikazi. More like he tried to do some boxing with Chikazi, but Chikazi just like kept pairing everything and blocking. And then Simmons would go in for a clinch. And the bet- that really wouldn't face Chikazi all that much as he would just push him away. Like Simmons wanted to wrestle, but he just couldn't get anything down on him. And then it led to Chikazi, like, finding the proper opening for the body kick here. And by the way, I am a sucker for body kicks, dude. I am a sucker for them, dude. Just, like, seeing... I don't know. There's something weird about being entertained of seeing a person get body kicked. And then it takes them, like, a couple seconds for them them to recognize. Like, oh, my goodness. Oh. My tummy. Oh, no. I'm gonna fall. I'm gonna fall. I'm gonna fall. And their arms drop down. They show anguish in their face. There's something strangely entertaining about it. Can't really point it out though. Oh, okay, interesting. Whenever I see a body kick finish, like, okay, it was not really specifically a body kick finish, but it was Chikazi hitting a body kick, which stunned Simmons, which then led to a head kick. All right, then. Um, I see a lot of street fights where we have guys wearing skinny jeans attempt body kicks, and like it's just in phase whoever they're fighting. Uh, but my favorite body kick I've ever seen was I think in a random video I saw years ago where it was Matt Hughes versus some random dude, and then Matt Hughes there's like a simple combination like there's a one two uh, or like a one two jab combo ending off with a body kick, and in the body kick like Matt Hughes lands a body kick, and the guy who got kicked gets hit, he tries to phase it all he tries to push it away I'll try to push off the pain try to no sell it, and then and then three seconds later. Then it just drops down like a sack, like holding his tummy. And there's something strangely entertaining about that. Can't really pinpoint it. But we go from the knockout, the knockout of the night, in my opinion, to the best fight of the night, which is Rayoni Barcelos against Clay Taha. So, Barcelos landing some devastating calf kicks like throughout this entire fight here. Oh man, they look so good. It looked like in the games. For UFC, like, uh, three and four. And then if you land the perfect leg kick, like, the dude's, like, his calf kind of, like, bends. And he just gets, like, and then he just falls back on his back. That's pretty much what happened here. Multiple times. I put here, uh, Barcelos, he fights, like, a video game character. And what I mean, though, so I am a huge fan of, like, Tekken. I play competitive Tekken. And, oh, man, dude, Barcelos, he's going in, landing some flying knees... Spinning roundhouse kicks, leg kicks, spinning reverse elbows, Superman forearm strikes. And he goes for a takedown, but Tower reverses it. But man, Brasolos, dude, he is throwing everything but the kitchen sink onto Taha. Uh, Brasolos tries to go for an armbar, but the result is both fighters uh, standing back up as Taha is able to defend himself. And for the first round here, I go for Brasolos. So... Taha himself, man, he was throwing a huge array of strikes onto Barcelos, but if you were to put them side by side, who landed more strikes and who were a lot, who landed more total strikes, who landed more significant strikes, who was more dynamic and who was um, who was more dynamic and who was the one doing a lot more mix-ups in their striking exchanges? I say Barcelos. Barcelos was winning overall in both um, a kill of total strikes, second with strikes. And being more, of a, being more of a dynamic striker, always level changing. He's going from like head kick to body kick to body punch to leg kick to go to do a forearm to the head. Like he's always mixing things up compared to um, Khalid Taha, who mostly was a headhunter for the majority of this fight here. So we get to the second round here. 
Uh, both fighters are trading combinations. Barbacelos is winning just a wee bit more, giving out just a couple, just a higher volume of strikes, along with better mix-ups. Once again, he does leg kick to body punch to a flying knee to the body to a forearm smash, ducks under, goes in for a quick one-two combination to the head, two straight jabs to a leg kick. He snaps the calf of Taha. Taha gets right back up, which leads to Barcelos coming in, clinching, landing him some clinching strikes with knees, elbows, forearms. Like, Barcelos throwing the entire array of strikes here was definitely fun to watch. In the final 10 seconds, Barcelos does rock Taha and tries to finish the fight, but the bell saves Taha, which leads to Dominic Cruz saying, Oh, Taha, you got saved by the bell, huh? Yep. Saved by the bell, haha. <laughs> so, both fighters at this point in the fight, in the third round, they're beginning... No, no I'll say beginning. They they have slowed down. They've slowed down. They're still trading each other with hard-hitting headshots. They both became headhunters. Uh, Brasellos, at this point here, he just stopped throwing kicks. Taha stopped throwing kicks. And these two are just sluggishly just punching, punching each other out as if they're rock'em, sock'em robots. Barcelos constantly landing these defensive knees... Whenever they get in close, uh, whenever they're getting close range, I like this because I also do this whenever I play Tekken. I play this character named Josie Rizal, and every time we get to the close range in a fighting in the fighting game, I always start out to, like go for, I always go forward and throw like these like, these like high knees here, and it's surprising how much how good that move is defensively, and that's what what Basaros did because obviously Taha he wanted to clinch or he tried clinching with Barcelos multiple times in this fight. But he just couldn't. And also, Barcelos here, he was, a more, he was a lot longer of a fighter. Had longer legs, longer arms. He was the one slowly picking apart Taha in both the long range and the mid-range. And the only instances to which it looked like Taha was winning would be in the close range. You know, winning in 50-50 exchanges. But you really can't do that. <laughs> you really can't do that if the guy he's fighting, Barcelos, is jumping up in the air trying to go for like high knees. And going like flying like defensive like knee strikes. So it really wasn't working for Taha. Uh, Ronnie Barcelos wins via unanimous decision. It was, without a doubt, in my mind, the best fight of the night. I say if there's any fight here that you should go look after, look up Ronnie Barcelos versus Khalid Taha. To me, that was the fight. It was the most funnest fight among all fights in the card. Uh, it was great back and forth action with, like, you know, you got guys here doing video game moves, two dudes. Look, I'm I'm a meathead, alright then. I'm gonna say that. I'm a meathead with a monkey brain. I love fights with two dudes just going at it, throwing everything on the line. Like Dana White likes like those types of fighters also. And this is awesome. Now it sucks that this fight happened right before the Arlovsky Bolster fight. So we went from wow, Chikazi versus Jamie, Jamie Simmons, knockout head kick, wow. Barcelos versus Taha. Wow, look at these two warriors going at it, throwing out all these cool striking moves and are just pressing forward on each other. Into our lost keeper's boaster, where it's like, look at these two statues here, man. They're standing there, throwing in some weak leg kicks, throwing in some jabs. Yep. Nothing much really happening there. Ugh, man. I'm going back to the Arlovsky thing again, but oh my goodness, I am such... I, okay, that Arlovsky versus Bolsa should not have been the coming event. I think it would have, been, would have been a lot more digestible for both like me, the audience, and the commentary team if this fight was like the second fight of the night. Because I think... Here's the thing. I would like it if I go to the main event excited or amped up for something. And we went from like exciting fights... Yeah, like exciting women's fight to to exciting knockout to a fast paced exciting fight to just this slow grind out not even fun like rock'em sock'em robots more like we got two dysfunctional like we got two malfunctioning rock'em sock'em robots and they can only punch each other during a certain set amount of time that's how I felt like watching this heavy fight and uh, man so we got two awesome fun fights to a boring fight. To a very enjoyable main event. And speaking of which, uh, during the... I got I got to mention this right now. Because uh, UFC President Dana White announced that middleweight champion Izzo Sanya would be moving up to 205 pounds to challenge John Blackwitz. So, I'm unsure... I'm really unsure about this. I don't think it's going to happen. I really don't. I don't think I'm going to see Izzo Sanya suit making the 205 pound 
you know, weight jump this early. I thought Izzo Desanya, he's going to make the jump in probably a year and a half from now. I didn't expect he would do it this soon. Uh, first of all, Izzo Desanya, he has to go through Robert Whitaker. That's one thing. Uh, Robert Whitaker in another interview says that he's very unhappy about this. And that he really wants to go settle his thing with Izzo Desanya first. Before dealing with Izzo Desanya possibly moving up. And I agree with Whitaker here. I don't like champions competing in other divisions. I don't like that. Because it will lead to one guy vacating his belt. And belts are being vacated left and right all the time nowadays. Yikes. Uh, Glover Sheriff goes on to say, Dana White, come on man. I'm an old man over here. You're going to give the shot to Izzo Sanya and make me wait? Five fights in a row beating these young guys? It's not easy. Give me the title shots. So... Is that Asanya moving up to fi- at 205 to fight against John Black? I think it's too soon. That's what I believe. I think it's too soon. I think there's still a lot of fun matchups for Izzo Asanya. I would still to see Darren Taylor versus Izzo Asanya. I think that would be a super fun fight to go see. Now, obviously, Darren Till, he has to go make his way back up. Um, Jared Kananier, Jack Hermanson. Uh, we got fighters. Yeah, we definitely have fighters in the middle division right now. Who would be fun matchups against Israel Adesanya? I think Israel Adesanya is also, I think, three fights away from surpassing like a couple records from Anderson Silva. So before Israel Adesanya makes his case into going up to two hundred five pounds, I think he has to go do uh, he has to go accomplish some things first at middleweight. If he can accomplish some things up in middleweight, then he can go and move up because I do know that he intends to go to heavyweight division at some point. Like he wants to follow the path of John Jones. And there are a lot of rumors going out there. There's a lot of beef going out there. Dana White likes it, actually. Where he'll like to see a possible future. Where we have Izzo Adesanya versus John Jones. But everyone's timelines right now just ain't matching. It ain't matching. We got Robert Whitaker, who wants to go fight against Izzo Adesanya. Like, because Whitaker is the proper number one contender for the middleweight belts. We got Glover Shera, who is the proper contender for Jan Blackowicz. But then... We got rumors out here for Adesanya to go fight against John Blackwicks. I think that's too soon. And then you have John Jones, who is moving from light heavyweight to heavyweight. And we don't know what his situation is. We got Michael Chandler, who could potentially be fighting against a top contender at the lightweight division. Even if he hasn't done anything yet in the UFC. Ah, oh man. It's just so, so confusing right now. Um, you know what? Glover Ishera, being the proper veteran that he is, he deserves his title fights. Hell he does. Arlovsky, I don't really think so. He really shouldn't get a title fight anytime soon. But Glover Shira, after his impressive performance, definitely. Most definitely, he should fight against uh, Jean Blackwoods. I think that would be a great matchup here. Uh, considering that Jan Blackwoods fights very similar to Yago Santos, um, it's still, I still believe Jan Blackwoods would win and fight against Glover Shira. But, you know, the odds of it, uh, the odds of the Shira winning and becoming the champion could possibly happen. There's a real possibility that, that could happen. There's a low probability of it actually happening. But still, again, it's still a probability. And, you know, Glover Shiver, John Blackwoods, I would definitely watch that fight. You're listening to the GSMC MMA Podcast. Coming back right after a short break here as I discuss Jan Shannon versus Claudia Cadella. Want to know the latest in soccer? Then listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Soccer Podcast. From MLS, the World Cup, and the Premier League. We've got you covered. The latest updates, the hottest matches, and news on the league's top players. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Soccer Podcast. David Beckham scores the goal to take England all the way to the World Cup Finals. Listen now. And we are back. And so I'll be discussing Claudia Cadella versus Jan Jonan. It was a very fun matchup. This coming, this was the first match for the UFC Fight Night event, which was headlined by Glover Deschera and Diego Santos. And going to this fight, it was a striker versus grapple here. Uh, the preview of this fight was focusing on the fact that although Claudia Cadella has a good, strong all-around game, if she could focus in on her grappling, she's going to go tire out Jan Jonan. And then she's going to go for a single leg or double leg takedown and grind her out. Jan, she herself likes the grind out fight, but she prefers grinding it out through the stand up. So we got Striker versus Grappler. Who is going to win? So going to this fight, I believe that it was way too soon for Jan. I thought that Jan needed 
maybe one more win under her belt before she tries to compete somebody as high ranked as Claudia Gadella. I think Yan was coming into this fight as a, as the number ninth ranked fighter. Claudia Gadella was ranked number sixth, but it's weird that the start, the women's short division it's highly competitive within the top ten. And that almost any of those women can't compete among the top five. But for me, I thought it was too soon for Jan to go complete uh, compete with something like, like Claudia Cadillo. But I was proven wrong here. I'm going to go down by my notes here. Uh, Jan is connecting a lot more in the jabs. But Claudia does daze Jan with the left hand. Then Claudia shoots in and successfully gets a takedown just 40 seconds into the first round. Jan getting some elbows in from bottom. Then they slowly get up to the cage. Jan is trying to get out, but Claudia is pressing her forward onto the cage. Jan is throwing some defensive strikes, while Claudia is primarily just putting on the pressure and putting her weight down onto her. Not really that much action coming in from top position by Claudia. More like, more like Claudia, she's grappling with Jan, and she's making sure that Jan is stay put on the ground. But she's not really working her offensive offensive wise. I was thinking here, okay, so Cadella here, she prefers the grind out game here. So she's gonna grapple with Jan, and hopefully, this is what I think, this is what I thought that she was thinking, and that her grappling uh, would tire out Jan, and then going to the second or third round, it would be more of a sense of Claudia shooting in for double leg takedowns, and then doing the ground and pound here. I didn't expect Claudia Cadella, I don't think Claudia Cadella came into this fight with a strategy of like, okay, I'm gonna go and stop her in the first round, or I'm gonna go and pull off as much damage as I can in the first round. I didn't think that was a strategy. So Claudia here, she's grappling with Jan, but Jan here, she's throwing up these vicious elbow strikes from the bottom. She's always working Claudia. I would say here, out of the two women, who was getting hurt more during these grappling exchanges here? I say Claudia Cadella was easily getting hurt more here. Um, after the end of the first round, in the bottom left hand of the screen, you see people like on Twitter reacting to the fights. And all of them are saying, wait a minute, is Jan winning the fight from bottom position? And I'll say yes. Jan was winning the fight from bottom position. She accumulated more strikes from both standing and on bottom. The only moment where it looked like Claudia Cadella was winning in terms of like the striking battle, whether it be the ground pound or in the stand-up, was the one instance to which Claudia dazed her. But for that one instance Claudia dazed Jan, Jan was able to pull off a good combination or was able to lay down some good strikes from bottom. I put down here, uh, referee separates them because Claudia Cadella... She's pressing on Jan onto the cage, doing some clinch work. But Claudia really isn't going for anything here. She really isn't. She's like pressing her body forward onto Jan to prevent to make Jan uncomfortable. But Jan is just fighting through, hitting in some hitting in some shots. Um, even though she's being clinched, she's laying in some vicious knees from even though her back is onto the cage, she still has room enough to go pull off like body knees and like kicks and like elbows and farm smashes. A uh, referee breaks them up because Claudia really isn't doing all that much. Uh, Jan tries to poke in with some leg kicks. Claudia grabs the leg and gets another takedown. So she gets two takedowns in the first round. Jan continues to land in some elbows from the ground. And making it really uncomfortable Claudia to square up for ground and pound. There was an instance where Claudia Cadella was pretty much stuck at half guard. And she just couldn't move. To any other position, she couldn't move to side position. She couldn't move back to. Uh, she couldn't move to mount. She even struggled going to even full guard position because Yan Shinan was just striking her so viciously that even if Claudia Cadella would a little bit try to square up from top position, she would be enduring a lot of damage. It was very similar to when GSP fought against Michael Bisping. That although GSP got the takedown in onto Michael Bisping, Michael Bisping was the one who was dealing with the damage. And in that instance, I'd be like, all right. So you got the takedown. Congratulations. Now, are you winning the grappling when you're in the ground? And the answer here is no. Claudia was not winning on the ground game, despite the fact that she was the one who initiated the ground game in the first place. So, uh, Claudia grabs the leg. Uh, Yon goes in for some vicious elbows. Uh, Claudia lands two shots, two good shots from top. Uh, first round goes to Yon. She did overall a lot more work from both ground and on top, and although and on standing. And although she did get taken down twice... Personally, for me, I do not reward fighters for just getting a takedown in the first place. Um, Merab Davishvili does this, and I think it's not going to end up well for him in the long term. In the sense that we have fighters like Merab Davishvili, or even Claudia Cadell here, who think all because they go for the takedown and are successful at it, that means they won the round. No, that's not really the case here. You got to go for the takedown. Okay, then. 
Good. You're in the good graces of the judges. You're good graces of the audience member. All right, then. Now, can you control your opponents? And the answer is no. You can't. Uh, I think I read somewhere online where it's like, hey, how would Khabib do well in the Olympics? And someone said that, well, Khabib, he's good at going for takedowns, yes, but his inability to control his opponent through not utilizing Sambo and other techniques and just going for pure wrestling is kind of lacking here. And that's why I see in Claudia Cadella in the sense that, yeah, she's going for the takedowns. Yes, she is scoring some points in terms of, you know, getting in the first place, but she's not really controlling her opponents. And then we go to the second round here. Uh, Jan continues to pick her apart with her stand-up game. Claudia can't really find an opening to grapple and has a much lower volume of strikes. As in, Jan is pulling off the you know, three-punch combinations. Jan being the much more longer fighter in the legs and arms. She is just picking her apart with leg kicks and the long jabs, pulling up three jabs in a row. And preventing... She's putting... He's also, she's also extending her left arm out. So she's making it uncomfortable for Claudia to go dive in there for a takedown because she knows that if she were to go in for a takedown, she could hit a vicious uppercut or an elbow on the roots of her trying to go for a takedown. Uh, Jan, Jan is picking her apart with the strikes. So the third round just goes to Jan here. So while Claudia Cadella, she wasn't able to go get the two takedowns that might have stolen her to the round for the first round, John Anik said that um, in the end of the second round, John Anik was saying, you know what, I give the first round to Claudia Cadella, second round goes to Jan. And when I see it, I'm like, okay, no way. First round goes to Jan. Second round goes to Jan also. I, Claudia Cadella should not be rewarded a round because of two takedowns that really didn't involve her having that much control of her opponents. I don't even think so. Um, I put down, I put down here. Uh, Jan continues to pick her apart yet again. Uh, she's um, Claudia can't find an opening to grapple. Third round goes to Jan yet again. So third round and second round are pretty much super similar in the sense that Jan poking her opponent over and over again. Claudia Cadell, she blew her load in the first round. Which is strange because Claudia Cadella herself really didn't do much in this fight. And Anik and, Cla- and Dominic Cruz were questioning this. They are like, wait a minute here. What's, um, what's Claudia Cadell doing here? In the first round, she was hyperactive. And then the second and third round here, she's just being very passive and you know, last days ago with her offense. And Dominic Cruz said it best. That He said, it looked like Jan Shannon, she really wants to go and stop her opponents and make her way up in the rankings. Claudia Cadella seems like she's the type of person who is very comfortable in her position right now in the UFC. And I got to agree with her. Uh, I got I to agree with Dominic Cruz here. Like some fighters, when I, like one thing about fighters who are trying to make a name for themselves in the, in amongst the rankings, whether it be at flyweight and strawweight, especially those two divisions, I think of like Rana Marcos, Amanda Rivas, uh, Mackenzie Dern, uh, Jan Shunan, Angela Hill. Like I like I'm uh, even Michelle Waterson. Strangely enough, though, even if she's a proper journeyman fighter, but we have these fighters here who are putting the extra effort into trying to go clamp the rankings here. Meanwhile, we have fighters like Carla Sparza and Claudia Cadella, two fighters who were calling each other out. I think before this fight, they were ranked number six and number seven. And both these women, this fight being stuck from like rank six to 10 for the longest time, are just not given any opportunities to go fight against someone who was part of the top five, which is weird because both Nina Ansaroff and Tatiana Torres are inactive. So why aren't Carlos Barza and Claudia Cadella moving up the rankings? And you know what? The truth here is because their recent performances aren't impressive enough to warrant them to go up high in the rankings here. Because from this performance here, Jan proved that she... Here's what I believe. I think Jan Shanan is definitely good enough. I think she's fighting one weight class... One weight class bigger than she really should be. I think she should compete at flyweight. I think Jan is a natural flyweight, but she's competing at strawweight for some reason. I think Jan is a fighter who is definitely good enough to fight against someone like Nina Ansaroff, Tatiana Torres. I don't think she's in the same level as like a Jessica Andrade, Rose Namunas, you know, Ryan Chichik. But Jan is at the, she's right there. She's right there. And I think she's definitely good enough of a fighter to be able to compete amongst the top five here. And with Jan Shinan here, she wins by UNAS decision. Because of this, she will not be competing amongst the top five of the Star Division. So good on there for Jan. Um, Claudia Cadella, I think at this point in her and Carlos Farzis' career, they're proper journeymen. They're proper journeymen gatekeepers right now in the UFC's uh, strike division. I think Carlos Barza. So, <laughs> so 
Side enough, Carly Esparza when she fought against I think I think it was Amanda Rebos. I think Carly Esparza she had a recent fight against Amanda Rebos, I think. And in that fight, uh Carla Esparza made very huge errors in that fight that put her in a position where it looked like she should have lost the fight because she wanted to go close it off. And you know what? Yeah, Carla Esparza, she fought sloppy in her last fight in order to possibly get a more exciting fight going in so the UFC best can support her. But in but then Carla Esparza got rebooked again for another prospect who was outside of the top 10. And Claudia Cadella, she needed this fight. Cadella desperately needed this fight to go defeat Jan and I think if Godella were to defeat Jan in this fight then, she would might be maybe one, maybe two fights away from potentially fighting at somebody who was amongst the top four of the women's strike division. That's what I believed. But because of the slots here, we might see Claudia Godella fill that same role as Carlos Barza and just constantly fight people outside the top ten. Now, it sucks. I get it. Uh, Claudia Godella and Esparza are currently in a good run right now. Uh, but their styles are... A, it's kind of boring. Uh, B, it's hard to market both of those fighters. And C, both of them are proper veterans of the sport here. And with the way how, and considering how active they are currently right now in their respective fights, it's understandable to see that okay, these two women, they're they're just the gatekeepers right now. Their goal is to go put over the young women who are trying to make up their way in the rankings. And there's a lot of them. Uh, the strike division and the flight division are, in my opinion, the two deepest divisions of the best fighters who are outside the top 10. That's what I believe. And here's the thing. The top five right now in the rankings for the strike division is pretty much stacked. It is. Uh, we got Rose Lami Yunus, Welly Zhang, Yuan H. Hachek, Jessica Andrade, who is clearly the number one contender for the flight division. And the fact that Jessica Andrade had a dominant victory over Kenny Chikagin shows how awesome of a fighter Just Gundrod is. I don't think Yan Shanan is good enough to fight against someone like Just Gundrod. I don't think so. Um, but you know what? Only time can tell. Uh, the, uh, the trajectory right now for Yan Shanan is very positive, and I can see only good things coming in from her. What's very funny about this, though, is that me right now are trying to get to one championship here. And currently, one championship's the Chinese fighters are the ones who are dominating everything right now. And I'm looking at the headlines here, and there's already a lot of talks already about, oh man, it would be kind of a big super fight here if we had Yan Shanan against Wally Zhang. Like, I'm looking right now, I see SB Nation, MMA Junkie, BJPen.com, and all the headlines and all like the subtitles here are like, oh man, it would be a huge, like a huge moment in MMA if we had two Chinese fighters main event a show. And I'm like, you know what? That would be awesome. That'd be great. Uh, currently, the anime champion, the women's anime champion for one championship, Angela Lee. She said herself that she really wanted... Because Angela Lee, she herself wants to be in the UFC. She does. She has aspirations of competing for the UFC at one point in her career, at, at some point in her career. But she goes on to say that, you know what? I would like it if there were a lot more Chinese fighters or a lot more Asian fighters, female fighters coming in into the AFC right now because there are a lot of really darn good prospects who are a lot of darn good fighters in one championship that people need to pay attention to right now. Although Adam, although the Adam weight division right now is really darn good for one championship, I would like it to be an Adam weight division for the AFC. If they were to have that and have that replace the women's feather division, I think we would have a lot more deeper pull of great fighters, of great female fighters in the AFC. So that will bring us to a close. All I got to say is thank you. Thank you for listening to the GSMC MMA Podcast. Brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'd like to you please remember to subscribe to this show and write a nice review. That really helps us. Also, you can please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you, and have a good night. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts MMA Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.